All right, good afternoon and welcome to Precient Therapeutics Investor Briefing. My name is Patrick Nelson, I'm the MD at REACH and I'll be hosting the session today. But we are joined by Precient CEO and Managing Director Stephen Yotomi clark uh, And on behalf of Stephen and myself, thank you for taking the time and joining us today. Today's session is an opportunity for you to hear how Precient Cell therapy, Therapies and Next Generation CAR-T platforms are taking cancer care conversation to from treatment to personalised cure, how their Omnicar and Cell Prime platforms developed with UPenn, Oxford, Peter Mac uh, can potentially enhance cancer treatment, making it safer, more scalable, more effective and affordable, um, and the ongoing progress of its targeted therapies, PTX 100 and 200, through clinical studies and towards commercialisation. Um, but also, very importantly, why Precient is positioned at the forefront of oncology treatment the largest sector in the healthcare, 280 billion. Now, if you, anyone on session today, if you would like to stay up to date with Precience news and announcement, please type PTX into the chat box at any time during the presentation and we'll keep you updated on their investor updates. Um, now, we expect the webcast to run. Uh, Precience business, uh, there's a bit to cover to give you a, a, a clear insights into it. So it, it probably run for about 40 minutes and then we'll allow for Q&A at the end of the session. If you'd like to ask a question, type it into the chat box. And, that box. If I don't answer it in the moment, don't worry, we'll get to all questions when we get into the, um, uh, when we get into the Q&A session at the end of the main body of the, of the presentation. Uh, any advice contained in today's presentation is general in nature. It doesn't take into consideration your personal circumstances. You need to decide for yourself whether it's appropriate for you. Uh, the information we put forward uh, at REACH presentations are suitable for self-directed investors, people who've got the experience, capabilities to do their own analysis and make an informed decision. And as such, this is a perfect forum uh, to in fact uh, move your research and understanding of business forward and, and thus any questions that come out of that, you've got the, uh, the MD available to be able to ask those questions directly. Um, as mentioned uh, at, at the beginning, by, uh, Precience, a biotech company, um, they're predominantly active in CAR-T therapy, uh, which is a promising cell therapy with a potential to revolutionise cancer treatment. They've got key licensing agreements with CAR-T Pioneers, uh, University of Penn, 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 Pennsylvania and Oxford and collab collaborations with Peter Mac Cancer Research Centre here in Melbourne. Uh, their Omnicar and Cell Prime, um, as I mentioned, safer, scalable, more effective, more affordable. Um, they've announced uh, many key milestones recently, the Omnicar patent. Um, uh, signed in the US, um, uh, taking it out to 2023, which is a key plank in the protection of the Omnicar platform. US FDA grants, grants orphan drug designation to PTX100 uh, a, a week or so ago, um, uh, and June quarterly's update, strong cash balance, multiple cancer programs, and, and progressing on multiple fronts uh, as all programs advance to schedule. So. Um, with ongoing significance to flow, the company is advancing um, towards becoming a central platform of the CAR-T revolution. Today we've got um, Stephen and Tony Clark to run us through, the CEO and MD. Um, and um, Stephen, you should have control of the slides now. I'll hand the floor to you. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you everyone for your time today. Uh, again, I understand there's a blended audience today, people who know prescient people who, uh, and those who would like an update and those who might be new to the story. So as per usual, I'll try to straddle both of those. But as Patrick said in his introduction, we are focusing on uh, transformational therapies for oncology. It puts us in front of a very large wave indeed. We're capped at about 120 million sitting here today at, um, at 19 odd cents, which is good with, despite the general market malaise of uh, more or less defied gravity, which is, which is wonderful, um, not satisfied here. We think we've got a long, long, long way to go and represent tremendous value. So they, to introduce Prescient for those that are unaware of us by way of company highlights, investment highlights, 
we have a simple business model at Prescient. We, we license technology from the best in the world and we work with the best in the world. It's, it sounds simple, it's hard to do, but indeed that's what we have. So there's a real sleep at night factor there with the science and the partnerships there. Um, truly the best in the world and some of them are here. You would have heard of Yale University and, um, and University of Pennsylvania, Ivy League universities, Oxford, Peter Mac. I think we should be very proud as Australians to have Peter Mac here in Australia, a world-renowned um, cancer research centre and cancer hospital uh, that is here in, in Melbourne and the Moffat Cancer Centre as well, third largest cancer centre in the US. So we have lots of shots on goal, which is important. You don't want to be a one-trick pony in this game, and we do not have that at all. Um, so we have two cell therapy platforms, and the emphasis there is on platforms, because platforms can yield products uh, and can give way to not only internal products, but external opportunities. And we have two targeted therapies in the clinic already. Um, so the rubbers hit the road with both of those programs and they are not only um, in the clinic but showing activity, which is very encouraging indeed. And with so many things on the go, um, we've got um, you know, regular news flow and as evidenced by the last, the last quarter has been a busy period for us and will be no different for the rest of the year as well. So we're not a black box type of biotech where we're running a single study and you've got to wait three years for a readout. That's not us. So to describe uh, our assets in a little bit more detail, uh, our cell, cell therapy platforms Omnicar and Cell Prime have, again, platforms that have given way to three products that we're developing and they are for AML, a type of blood cancer, for a type of brain cancer called glioblastoma and for HER2 positive solid cancers. So they're what, they're what we're progressing using these platforms to create the world's best cell therapies. In addition, we have targeted therapies, as I mentioned before, PTX100, which is a first-in-class inhibitor of the Rho uh, and RAS pathway, and a PTX200, which is a very unique AKT inhibitor. Both of those are problematic proteins. Um, here's another way of looking at our pipeline, really, and the take-home message here without going over what I've just said is the richness of the pipeline. This is a pipeline that belies our size and that you would expect to see in a company many times our size. So what we're able to offer for shareholders is basically a portfolio approach that diversifies risk on the basis of not only the types of cancers being treated, but how they're being treated and the stage of their development. So a lot of risk diversification, but more importantly, we're all in it for the upside. There are multiple opportunities here. Each one of those is a potential company maker and the staggered stage of their development um, implies that there's going to be lots of staggered news flow as well. So a nice diversified portfolio that um, shareholders in our company can be very proud of and very excited about. I'm going to start with those um, those ones at the bottom there, you know, the PTX 100 and 200 first, there are targeted therapies focusing on problematic proteins that drive cancer uh, and cancer growth inside the cells. So that's what they're targeting with these proteins inside the cell. So to start off with PTX 100, which is a first in class inhibitor of the RAS pathway. This is licensed from Yale University. It's currently in a study for blood cancer. I'll get to that in a minute, but we're building on the work that has been done at Penn and Indiana previously and here in Australia under the leadership of Miles Prince, who is the foremost haematologist blood cancer expert in the country, a genuine world authority in, in T-cell lymphomas. Um, and again, he's, he's a man of genuine international standing in this field. And we are building on this work and now doing what's called an expansion cohort, focusing in on uh, this type of blood cancer called T-cell lymphoma. So what does the landscape look like in this and how do we compare? Well, especially in peripheral T-cell lymphoma, um, there are a number of approved drugs. They do not work particularly well. But this slide here just describes their toxicities. And um, this is an increasingly difficult hurdle for drugs in this space is that the drugs that are out there are quite toxic and do not work well. Not a great combination when they don't work well and are very toxic. 
by comparison, the PTX100 so far has had an excellent safety profile with not a single serious adverse event, uh, adverse event due to the drug. So as described in those dot points, it's good for two reasons. One is this patient population is quite knocked about and you want to be very gentle with these patients so you don't want a very toxic therapy. It also means that it's a good candidate potentially for combination therapy where you want to add it for synergistic benefit with another approved therapy. You can't do that or that's very, very limited with a drug that is already exhibiting toxicity by itself. So that's very important. So how does it fare from an efficacy point of view? Well, we're getting a very encouraging signal. So the standard of care here, and I'll just pop up a picture tells a thousand words. Um, with the standard of care, which is that red line, you would normally expect a quarter of patients, 25, 27% at most would have some sort of response. And of those, as illustrated, those lucky patients, that quarter of patients, you would only expect to get three to four months of benefit. And you can see we've already got a patient who was at 12 months and there's another one there at 32 months so far, which is, um, which is incredible. Uh, and we've got some more data there uh, up, up our sleeves as because we're recruiting in this cohort right now. So as I mentioned before, it's currently in this expansion cohort underway. We're due to fully recruit that this year. Um, what's available to us after this study is a potential registration study. So think of this as a phase two study that we're currently recruiting and reading out um, next year, fully recruited this year, we're on track, and it could be the equivalent of a phase three study starting next year if things go well. It's the shortest path to market, and to give you an idea of the size of the prize, it's not a very prevalent disease, um, but it is very, very high value. Uh, you can see here with a uh, particular type of medication there called Folatin does not work particularly well. Again, 27% of patients, three to four months uh, of benefit at most, and that's $500,000 per patient per year. So that's the size of the prize. And in um, relatively late breaking news, like uh, a week or two ago, um, the US FDA has granted PTX100 orphan drug status and what that means is that we are able to have market exclusivity um, for P, uh, peripheral T cell lymphoma in the event of success. So think of any other business. Imagine if any other business, the regulator said, okay, you have no competition for seven years. Well, that's what's now been granted in the world's biggest healthcare market for PTX 100. So that's some major news that I think the market might still be coming to terms with. Uh, it does incredible things to your NPV. PTX200 um, is a different type of drug that focuses on a different pathway for different cancers. And in this case, it's in acute myeloid leukemia, uh, where we're under the leadership of Jeff Lancet. Again, we work with the best. Jeff was the first guy in 40 years to get a drug approved for this disease. Uh, it was bereft of innovation for decades until um, you know, Jeff came along and got a drug called, um, called Vixios approved um, from inception all the way through to phase three approvals. So he's a genuine world leader and this is the next trial that he chose to lead. So we announced um, a, a month or so ago that we had a fourth patient with a complete remission in this disease. In a, in a disease um, uh, a patient population where you normally, unfortunately, once they're relapsed, patients have ba basically six months to live and maybe less, and we've had four with remissions and one partial response so far. So that's very encouraging and we're currently got an expansion cohort underway at 45 milligrams per meter squared that we're hoping is the Goldilocks amount, uh, Goldilocks dose. And this also has orphan drug designation, which I just described for PTX100. The same exclusivity uh, is granted to this drug as well for AML. So that is, I've just described um, PTX100 and 200, our targeted therapies. Either one of those is a company maker and a company in itself. I'm now going to switch gears and talk about our platform technologies and cell therapy and this process called CAR-T. Cell therapy, as the name suggests, is using living cells as a therapy. And this is embodied in CAR-T. So basically a patient goes to 
a cancer patient gets blood drawn and these immune cells are isolated from the blood and outside of the body they are engineered so that instead of just fighting infection, which is good for infection but not great for cancer, we now put a receptor on them that can recognize cancer. And this type of genetically altered immune cell is called a CAR T cell. And millions of these are grown up and they're given back to the patient. And it's had unprecedented responses. This is a relatively new technology, um, but already it's transforming medicine in a way that we've never seen ever. So it's even leading um, very conservative cancer doctors to finally concede, okay, we can we can use the word cure now when we're talking about certain blood cancers, which is the, they were the first cabs off the rank for CAR-T was certain types of blood cancer, or B-cell malignancies in particular. And, you know, 10 years out, these patients have gotten durable responses from the very first clinical trials. And, um, and again, on the bottom right, you know, Janssen with a, you know, got a, a recent approval for multiple myeloma with a 98% response rate. Like we've never seen anything like this in the history of medicine. And it's just starting as evidenced here, um, you know, the, the history of immunology and, and, and cell therapy development. This was pioneered by the University of Pennsylvania there in 2017. Um, with, uh, with Kim Raya, or 2012 with, with Kim Raya and finally approved. And, and where we are today is uh, it's just exploding because of the data with hundreds of companies now um, entering the field, all of them with their own secret source that they think is going to win, a special target that's going to win, a special cell type that's going to win. And the beauty of this in this growing field we're positioning ourselves to be agnostic on that and uh, to really play with anyone and to you know, get everyone up that curve. That's where we sit. I mentioned before that the University of Pennsylvania was a pioneer in CAR-T and they were. They were the very first ones to, uh, well, you would have heard of Carl June. He is, uh, is at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, again, the very first one approved was Kim Raya that's now given way to there's six products now approved by the FDA. So it sounds like science fiction, but it's not. Uh, there's now six approved therapies in a very short space of time, all on the first generation of CAR-T. And it's, it's yielding a, a multi-billion dollar industry um, already, even though it's just at the start. But like any brand new technology, the first iteration, the first generation are going to be problematic. So I've listed some of them here. I won't go into detail, but basically um, these therapies can be very unsafe because you've got a living therapy that can go and attack the cancer in a very uncontrolled manner that can lead to inflammation and, and even patient death in some circumstances, akin to the type of um, inflammation that was um, killing COVID-19 patients at the start of the pandemic. This, that's the same sort of thing that can overwhelm a patient with CAR-T, unfortunately. And there's no way of controlling it once you infuse it because it's a living cell. Um, living cells do what they do. They grow and divide and grow and divide. So um, that's, that's a major one. So it's only reserved now for the sickest of the sick because of that. Also knowing what to target um, on the surface of the cancer and what happens if the cancer mutates and you get what's called escape and most tumours will mutate and escape. That's just the sad reality of it. Um, production efficiencies, it's currently a little bit clunky. It's a very bespoke type of therapy, uh, patient by patient. And then there's exhaustion. These things get puffed out very quickly, these cells, and can die out um, before their job is done. Uh, trafficking, how do you get them to where they need to get to in the body? Not so big a problem for blood cancers, but for solid tumours is a major problem, as are the last two, being able to penetrate the tumour. And once you find the location and you penetrate the tumour, you then have to deal with a little protective microenvironment that the tumour has built as a survival mechanism around it to extinguish any immune response. So that's what it's going to have to take for CAR-T to, to overcome, to get to where it needs to get to, which is you know, leading you know, current generations of CAR-T to be they're, they're certainly not optimal is maybe the, 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 the best thing you can say about them. Um, as wonderful as they are in a couple of blood cancers, um, generally it's going to have to overcome all of these obstacles. They don't last. They're, 
uh, you know, they're too expensive and it's not sustainable and they're just not as effective as they could be. And this is where we come in. Uh, with our two platforms, Omnicar and Cell Prime, I'll go into a little bit of detail. You can see here, just visually, we tick every box. And between the two of them, there's actually great synergy between these two platforms that will make sense in the coming slides. I'm gonna start talking about Omnicar and we're especially excited about this. This is a game changer. So once again, this came from the very same institute that pioneered CAR-T, uh, Professor Powell and Professor, Associate Professor Powell and Professor Chalkis um, came up with this modular CAR-T that basically, uh, think of it, pulled apart by little bits of Velcro. So you've got the targeting ligand and the signaling domain, they come together with a covalent bond to form a fully armed CAR-T. And it's truly agnostic on the type of targeting ligand we use and also on the type of cell. So when I say it's a platform, this is what I mean. We can use anyone's targeting ligand. The whole field is exploding with new companies focusing on targeting ligands or immune cells. Well, guess what? We're agnostic on those. We don't need to pick a winner uh, because we can work with any or all of them. This is uh, a short illustration to show how this works. You can see you've got the T cell here with half of the construct there with uh, at this stage the uh, and, and one bit of Velcro popping out of the cell. At this stage, the cell is inert. Um, it's alive but waiting for your command. It's not yet working until the doctor administers the targeting ligand which binds to the cancer cell with the corresponding bit of Velcro. And then the two bits of Velcro come together. You get a fully armed CAR T and then you get on-demand tumor killing. So this simple act of modularity confers a bunch of properties that enable us to overcome all of the issues that I've discussed before. So it's incredibly powerful. You so often you see in technology, the most effective solutions are the ones that are very elegant, and this is exactly what this is. So again, with safety and control, we can tune up and down the responses with targeting, we can use any targeting ligand. Um, again, I'll, I'll just leave this on the screen for you to have a look at, but um, believe me when I say that this simple act of modularity enables us to target uh, and address all in one fell swoop um, the, uh, a lot of the issues facing current CAR-T. So basically, uh, this is a popular slide because what I'm trying to do is uh, compare it to Omnicar to current CAR-T and if you think CAR-T in the immune system is uh, it's a soldier in the immune system fighting the cancer, current generations only have one map and one weapon, can only hit one target, you can't redirect this soldier and you can't communicate or control with that soldier. So that's current CAR-T, as wonderful as current CAR-T is, that's what it is. Whereas Omnicar is a soldier that you can arm with any weapon, including several at once can give, be given any map for multiple deployments, can be directed against any target, including multiple targets at the same time, and importantly, full communication and control at all time, even mid-mission, and can even send images back. So once again, this is a, if you remember any, any slide, just remember this one, is that as wonderful as CAR-T is, we're really taking it to the next level. I've described here some of the control features and believe me when I say we've got data supporting all of these, these are here for illustrative purposes. We can titrate up the activity just as you would a regular medicine. The more pills you take, the stronger the effect up to a point where it's toxic. But that's not possible with current CAR-T, but we can do that. We can have that same level of control that patients need and doctors expect. We can, we can have that same level of control with Omnicar. We can even switch it on and off like a remote control. Even though these are living cells inside the body, this simple act of modularity will enable not only to titrate the activity up, but can switch it off altogether and can even switch it back on. And what this has two benefits. It's not just safety. In case a, a threshold is breached, you can switch off the therapy, but you can switch it back on again. This is important for persistence. This metronomic stimulation builds a better phenotype of cell that lasts a lot longer. Target redirection at the moment, it's a real Achilles heel of current CAR-T is you go to all the effort of making one and if the tumour mutates, 
you've got a useless CAR T that now is um, you, the tumor has shed what's on its surface and has changed its disguise and the CAR T no longer recognizes this new disguise but simply switching out the new binder we're able to redirect this and I'll show you some compelling data in a couple of slides showing exactly that but also being able to target multiple markers on the cancer at the same time. This is called multivalency. And this is going to be uh, very important, especially in tumours that are what's called heterogeneous, so that have lots of different antigens on them, uh, including solid tumours. This is using version one um, Omnicar, that this is PENS data showing this exact proof of concept in in vivo models showing that you give the binder by itself nothing happens uh, but you give once you give the, the binder and the cell they come together and switch on and you get on-demand tumor killing and the more binder you give the more tumor you kill and the longer the subjects live so this is the sort of response you would see with a conventional medicine this level of control this has not been done with um, with cell therapies and this is another world first experiment um, that we put out um, towards the end of last year showing that we can rearm them. So yes, we can, we can arm these Omnicar cells and get beautiful controlled killing uh, in a nice, you can, we can control that steepness of that green curve so it's not too steep that it's you know, you know, causing inflammation and not, too, uh, and not too flat that it's not fast enough tumor killing. We can have a nice, nice ideal curve. That's one thing, that's good enough. But what we then did is then wash those cells and let them regenerate such that they're unarmed again, so that you've got a bunch of naked cells. The cells are still there, but there's no binder. And then we simply add the binder again, and this happens. We get not only the same level of killing, but we get the same kinetics of killing. So the take home message here is that these cells behave exactly the same whether we're pre-arming them or letting them rest and rearming them. So it's a very predictable, uh, very, um, very obedient, this system. And this is the other one I was talking about, redirection. This is another world first experiment. This is pretty cool, so bear with me. So two different types of brain cancer cells were put into the mix, one of them overexpressing the green one, HER2. The other, one, the other types of cells were overexpressing the red ones, the EGFRV3. They'll put together in like a soup. Now this is indicative of what might be there in a patient because these GBM patients, these brain cancer patients, they have cells expressing either or both, but very rarely, or almost never is it just one target. And what we did, we, arm, we threw in Omnicar armed against EGFRV3 and bang, straight away, you can see it was absolutely smashing the EGFR V3 positive tumors. And curiously, leaving the green ones alone. And that's exactly what we want because we're not directing it against that yet. And at 20 hours, all we did, we did not add any new cells. At 20 hours, we just added the green binder, just like giving another medicine. And this is what happened, rapid redirection. So it basically stopped killing the red one and immediately started killing the green cells. Um, so this has never been done before. To rapid redirection from one cancer to one cancer antigen to another cancer antigen without the need for any new cells. So once again, very powerful. And even though it's a biological system which is very complex, this is proving to be very obedient. There's some other advantages too. I know we're running out of time, but uh, there's some COGS benefits. In order to try to replicate this, this would be millions and millions of dollars per patient. But with Omnicar, you do the hard work once and then you just issue the binders. So there's no time delay. There's not 22 days of manufacturing for each single cell. There's not hundreds of thousands of dollars for each cell. So there are some real COGS benefits here, uh, which makes sense. So uh, not only does it make sense for patients, but it makes sense commercially as well. And so what do we do with this wonderful platform where 
developing actual products, as I mentioned before, and these are detailed here. Uh, we've got one for AML, a disease you heard before that we understand very, very well. And we're using the unique features of Omnicar to titrate this therapy up for patients who are very fragile, very knocked about, who can't tolerate normal CAR T a lot of the time. It's too toxic for them. So this is able to titrate that up um, and also co-arming it against two um, antigens that are really important and validated in AML. And to be able to do this sequentially is very, very unique. So there's a lot of eyes on this program. The second one is for HER2 positive solid cancers, especially breast cancer and ovarian cancer and also gastric cancers. You would have heard of Herceptin and, and drugs like that which target HER2. Um, unfortunately for those patients who rebound um, after those therapies, there's not much left, but they do still overexpress this target, and that's what this exploits. So again, titrating up for improved safety, and um, especially in solid tumours where HER2 is, ex is expressed in healthy tissue, this gives you the control you need to treat this safely. Um, and there's a bunch of other features there as well that, um, that we're looking to exploit for this to win where others have not won before. And in GBM, glioblastoma multiform, again, think of this like AML. This is mutating very rapidly. One target's not going to cut it. Um, and to be able to persistently dose the binder to, um, to win the war. So it's not a one and done approach. You can get these cells to hang around as long as you need to um, through the persistence, uh, persistent dosing of that binder is going to win where this hasn't. And as you can see, um, these are very, very differentiated products. There is nothing like these three programs out there today. You do not want to be in a growing area, a Me Too program in this. This steps right away from that. Think of those two soldiers when you're thinking about how these sit. Now I'm going to talk about our second, uh, this is the last leg of the presentation. Um, thanks for bearing with me. This, this is a, another cell therapy platform that we um, announced in the last quarter called Cell Prime. And we're incredibly excited about this. So it's basically really complementary to what we're doing with Omnicar. This is producing a better type of cell. Um, and I'll just skip ahead. It's ready for clinical testing right now. So all of that preclinical data in mice has been done and it is ready for the clinic right now. And guess what? We're going to be our own first customers. It basically produces a superior cell, not just for us, but for anyone. And we, although we developed this in collaboration with Peter Mac here in Australia, we own all of the IP. There is no fee leakage out on Cell Prime M. So it basically produces a more youthful type of immune cell that can hang around longer and kill better. So it produces you know, better, more memory cells, more helper cells, and they work better, they double tumor control. They can also home to the site a lot better there in the green, so they can actually locate the tumor. This is especially important in solid tumors. And to visually explain how this sits, I described it, Omnicar is the, is the modular system there, but it's agnostic on the binder and it's agnostic on the cell type, um, but Cell Prime M is actually producing a better type of cell that persists longer and gets to where it needs to get to. But if it can work for a next generation therapy, it can also work for any current generation CAR T. And that is um, the no-brainer component of Cell Prime. It's a real walk-up start. So you'll remember those problems that um, of current CAR T I showed earlier. This is a detail about how Cell Prime M solves these in a really complementary manner to Omnicar. So production and efficiency, it's producing a lot better yield of the cells you want. The cells last longer, they get to where they need to, they chew through the tumour and they hang around long enough to, um, to uh, overcome that um, tumour micro environment that suppresses the response. So you can see it's a really complementary um, type of approach. Uh, without going into too much of a science lesson, um, this is going from left to right is how these T cells, these immune cells evolve and mature. They're all discrete populations. All of the data, um, third party data, not prescience data, all of the data showing that those people who have had the best CAR T responses, those patients who have been cured, have a certain type of cell. They've been given these central memory T cells. So 
towards one end they have good renewal capacity but don't kill a lot and at the other end it's the opposite they kill but don't last very long so at the moment too many of these are made in car by CAR-T processes so you've got um, effector cells that are um, you know, they just die off quickly they chew through the tumor and then die but those patients who have had basically cures and really good responses, they have these cell types, especially the central memory T cells there. Uh, and basically what cell prime does, we push to that phenotype. We make more of those cells that make a difference. And again, without diving too deep into the data because of time, um, this is all, all the robust data we've produced, 50% more. We, we make 50% more of the cells that count uh, and it, as a result, it doubles tumour control and survival. So this is using a conventional CAR-T against HER2 uh, in a really awful type of tumour that is so awful it's actually resistant to CAR-T. And by doing nothing else but making it by dropping in cell prime M during the manufacturing process, bang, we double tumour control and we double survival. By doing nothing else, but, made, but dropping this into the manufacturing process for, um, for less than a day. Uh, and you can see here, we have um, more a sustained increase in both desired cell types of um, central memory cells, and we have less of the less desirable ones as well. So we're pushing on both ends of, that, uh, of the seesaw in our favour. We also double the proportion of helper cells, which as the name suggests, is really important in synergizing the, um, the immune response against the tumor. So helper cells are very, very important. The more of them you have, the better the response you get, and we double the proportion of that by adding cell prime. When I spoke about trafficking, that's like the, the nose that's on the tumor that sniffs it, you, know, you can sniff out where it is, like a, in the same way that a sniffer dog can sniff out the gradient of a, um, the smell of a drug and in a crowded airport can, can find, or a border crossing, find, find the luggage that has the, um, the, the drugs in it. Uh, cells work in a similar way, finding what's called a chemokine gradient. And basically, the more of these receptors you have, the better. And bang, we've got, you know, a much significantly higher expression on these for these cells to get to where they need to go. So basically these are cells with the ideal attributes. They last a lot longer. In fact, they've got decades of memory, this, this immune phenotype, uh, immune cell phenotype. They can penetrate the tumour, they can find the tumour. Uh, they're genomically stable and in a surprise finding also have some antiviral properties. Just going to touch on our business model. Um, Again, platforms are one thing, but they produce products. And Omnicar is going to has yielded three products that we're developing, but can also work with external parties. And the same goes for Cell Prime. So that is very, very scalable. Um, so we're taking a position in in this gold rush of cell therapy. We've got a shovels to the gold rush type of positioning that diversifies our risk and is highly scalable. So anyone developing this under partnership will do so off our balance sheet and in parallel to what we're doing uh, and enables us to have a lot earlier revenue potential than it would otherwise be possible. And you know, I've just illustrated here some of these licensing arrangements, what they'd normally look like. You get upfront fees, then milestone fees, and then royalty payments, and this is scalable. You have one on top of the other. Now these upfront fees for earlier stage programs like ours are not big. Um, in fact, sometimes they're non-existent, but what you do have is these milestone fees and all of the cheesecake is made in, in the event of success. The importance here is that we get so many bites at the pudding, it's not funny. So um, again, highly scalable, unique position that Prescient is in with, with this. So I, I won't gild the lily too much, but I will finish with where's the end game here. We're developing products. Um, but we see a patient-centric ecosystem uh, with Omnicar at its heart. Um, we know what Apple did for their ecosystem. It's never been done with medicine. We think it's possible now. We see a world in the not-too-distant future where patients go to the doctor and get their tumour characterised. Um, this happens already, but then the doctor will be able to go to a binder library and say, okay, I need to target your specific cancer with your profile, I need binders one, two, and five. 
and you plug them onto a cell type of your choice. It could be a, a, a T cell, it could be an NK cell, it could be a macrophage, and you get the most bespoke therapy in the world that is not only personalized, but is also efficient. So normally personalization comes at the expense of efficiency, but very much the opposite here. So in summary, um, a top-down analysis in this market is very ideal, it's very wise, it's defensible because where do you look when um, there's a lot of macroeconomic instability? Well, what's recession-proof? Well, healthcare is recession-proof as it gets. Uh, and what's the biggest market within healthcare? Well, it's oncology. It's hundreds of billions of dollars and growing. And you look, okay, within this biggest market, what's the fastest growing area? And it's very clearly cell therapies. And okay, who is now in this fastest growing area? Who's at the forefront and who's going to be agnostic on the winners? And it's going to be that company that has not only next generation programs, is agnostic on the target, on the cell, and has a highly scalable model. And you know what? Let's just press in. We've got a very, very unique positioning. So from a top-down point of view, um, we just make sense. Uh, and uniquely so, I'm very proud to say. So in short, four blue chip oncology assets, um, I've described them, um, I won't go over it again, but there's so much to press in. Uh, we've got a nice deep pipeline, we've got superior positioning, um, both internal programs and external uh, positioning ourselves with that shovels to gold rush positioning and it's highly scalable. And we've got the tailwind of this huge growing market. So that is pretty much all you need to know about us. I'll leave it on here uh, and look forward to your questions. Thanks, Stephen. Um, <clears throat> quite a few questions coming through. So uh, we'll start off with uh, Max. In regards to recent Omnicar in vivo studies noted in the quarterly, can you describe the noted optimizations that are required and provide any further colour to these studies or results? or will this be subject to further announcement? Um, I think your question, it's, it said in vivo for Omnicar. Is yes. that what it said? So, so we've not put out any in vivo data on version three yet of Omnicar. So we can look forward to that. I can tell you they're underway right now. Um, of course, every model needs optimizing, and so we're going through that at the moment. But what we're seeing, um, without giving too much away is, is encouraging. In, in the course of research and development, there's normally a lot of attrition that goes through you know, that learning curve early on. Um, we're seeing very little of that now, which is amazing and really unexpected. So again, underlying how predictable and obedient this system is, uh, it's, it's even thrown up a few positive surprises. So we look forward to sharing that in due course. We want to move away from being the sort of company that puts out every tiny little bit of, um, of research that comes out. That's not gold standard, uh, but we are very, very busy and look forward to bundling that and keeping the market informed. Also, we have to keep in mind for the benefit of shareholders and, and the company in the medium to long term, we have to protect our pattern positioning. And as we keep discovering new things, guess what, we're having, we've, we've got new patentable material as well. And you want to make sure you patent those before you announce them, lest you shoot yourself in the foot and make it public and therefore unpatentable. All right. Um, there's, there's a few questions around cell prime A, cell prime M and timing. So I might just wrap that into, Stephen, can you make a general comment, any, any further comment you can make on cell prime A or M and timings? Cell Prime M has been disclosed, so I'm not sure what, um, if there's specific questions on Cell Prime M, I'm happy to answer those. Um, Cell Prime A is uh, being wrapped up at the moment, that is on track, and we'll be announcing that in due course. Michelle's asked, how will you safely and effectively the, the, the efficient, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm here my, my wording <laughs> yeah, uh, of the Omnicar platform be specifically determined when combined with CAR-T therapies not clinically trialled before. If there is no data sets for comparison, how will Omnicar be independently validated? And what is the control mechanism that enables the switching on and off of dosing and switching between targets? 
Yeah, there's a lot in that. Thanks for that question. Um, firstly, yes, we're, this is in development. We're not pretending that this is, and I'm, I don't think the question is saying is this approved because we're certainly not approved. Um, but how is it safer? So it works because don't forget when you have an armed Omnicar cell, or when you have an armed, when you have any CAR T cell, it grows and divides and grows and divides and grows and divides. What you have with Omnicar is once it uh, it's armed and it divides, it gives rise to an unarmed Omnicar cell. So at all stages, plus you get natural receptor turnover. I, I won't go into that, but um, that's going into the scientific weeds. But basically all of the daughter cells are unarmed and therefore waiting always for the command of the doctor to, to administer the binders. So that is how it's safer. So you can titrate up, always limited by the number of binder binders that the doctor is administering. So the existing armed ones are doing their job, that's fine. Um, but that's how you switch it. You, you can tune it up and by stopping administration of the binder, you tune it down. And that is what is safer. Um, and of course, the ultimate safety is if you do happen to get a deleterious event, um, at the moment, there's nothing you can do but treat the symptoms. If you just stop administering the binder altogether, the therapy will switch off because it will turn over and there are no more armed cells to to um, to inflict any inflammation. Uh, and uh, if the doctor so wishes, they can re-administer that binder and switch the therapy back on. There was another questionnaire on validation. Well, that's what these studies are, that we've got to make sure they get into the clinic. There is no head-to-head -head comparison that we want to make. We do not want to be a Me Too company. So there's CD19 CAR Ts out there. We have no interest in developing a Me Too CD19 that happens to be modular. That race has been run and won and we could probably find a niche for ourselves there, but there is so much opportunity. Why would I run towards the competition? Uh, so we won't be doing a head-to-head -head on something that exists right now when we can create a brand new modular system to create a winner and plant the flag where there are no flags right now. So that's what we're doing. Um, and in terms of validation, well, that's, um, that's what the studies will be. We're doing IND enabling studies now. Uh, to satisfy the regulators to get into the clinic to generate the data. But uh, to be clear, some of these questions, um, especially the early question, part of that question seem to be almost akin to, okay, we're producing, um, bear with me, it almost seemed like you've got a drug and now you're making a generic that's somehow you know, cheaper or better or whatnot. How, what are you doing to compare it? We're not in the business yet. These are brand new novel therapies, standalone novel therapies that are best in class. Uh, Bryson's asked, how long does it, a registration trial take if PTX100 was granted registration? Normally, uh, these types of registration, these phase three type of studies are five to seven years sometimes and hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, whilst we've not got specifics from the regulator yet, you could expect it to be a fraction of that. So you could do a registration study with, let's say, 100 and 120 patients, which is, um, again, a fraction of that what would normally happen, and you could get that recruited in, say, three years uh, in a multi-centre study. We're not geared up for that just yet, but that's that shows you how much shorter it is. Yeah. Scott, in, in, addition uh, to, in addition to not having to do like a, a four-year phase two study, right? We're doing that in one year. Um, Scott, in regards to your question, um, I imagine that probably needs to be announced before um, it can be referenced. I'll check offline and if there's any information I can provide back to you, I will do so. Uh, Glenn uh, has made a comment. Great presentation. Can we have a copy of the presentation for future understanding? You may. We will load the presentation up onto uh, the webs, uh, the investor portal and we will send you a link to it and the recording of the presentation as well. Is there any further questions that anyone has? Well, we've got Stephen on the session. I'll give it one moment. Um, if not, uh, in, in a moment we'll call the session to a halt. Stephen, thank you very much. Um,
Absolutely. They come a lot of territory uh, today, um, uh, very, very well. Um, to everyone that's taken the time to join the session, uh, thank you as well. Uh, as you leave the session, uh, please provide feedback. There is a short survey. We'd appreciate any feedback on how you found the presentation. Is there anything else that can be done to improve it? Um, but um, other than that, I will leave the last word with you, Stephen. Yeah, thanks. So I think it just goes on to that last slide. So we've got these amazing, not only just four products, but two of them are platforms, which gives rise to so many opportunities internally and externally. It's a highly scalable business that we're in. Believe me when I say we're at the front of the curve, um, there are some positives to that. There's some challenges with that too, while you wait for people to catch up. But to be in that position like that is very, very rare and especially with the the tailwind that uh, is there in that last column. So you can do a lot worse than uh, than look at Prescient, that's for sure. And we're very busy, very capable team, very driven, and look forward to updating you um, as we progress. Thank you for your time.